Good morning. Good morning. Okay, so um, today is March 26th. It's my sister Michelle's birthday. Michelle, if you're watching this, happy birthday. Okay. Uh, I call her Missile because when I was really little, I couldn't say Michelle. So I. I guess what I said sounded like missile. So I still call her missile to this day. Okay, that's her nickname. Okay. Um, so anyhow, uh, she had a great day this weekend. They kind of celebrated on Sunday. So happy for that. Okay. Um, anyhow, uh, yesterday we were talking about what became known as the Munich Pact. All right, now, guys, this is a defining moment and probably the greatest example of appeasement leading up to World War II that exists. So if you were writing about this on a test, which you will be, this would probably be the most common uh, example of appeasement, okay, where Neville Chamberlain, the British Prime Minister, uh, Premier Dallivier of France, got together in a room with Adolf Hitler, and Benito Mussolini in Munich in September of 38 to basically carve up Czechoslovakia and hand the Sudetenland, which included, as I mentioned yesterday, the Skoda Works, which is the second largest munitions factory in Europe. And Hitler will move his troops into the Sudetenland. Now, the question is, which is answered in the notes here, how long will it take? Hitler to send his troops into Czechoslovakia. Well, here's the thing. Hitler signed a document saying that if this pact was honored, this Munich pact, that he would seek no new territorial gains in Europe. So Neville Chamberlain returns to London after this meeting. He's met on the tar tarmac at the airport by a large group of people. And he holds up this piece of paper. And he says that on this document, which bears my name as well as the name of Herr Hitler, that he will seek no new territorial gains in Europe. We have peace in our time. And the crowd erupts in applause. We have peace in our time. Front page headline in newspapers all over the world. The next day, peace in our time. Yeah. Right. You trust this dictator? Yes, sir, Jackson. This makes Hitler kind of pretty interesting because I mean, throughout like history, at least like some of like the dictators had the sense where like, you know, I'm like by my war, right? Like, it's some sense of pride or like honor or something, but Hitler no honor here doesn't care. No, at all. And the same could be said with communist dictators. Yeah. Okay. Now we know today that if Britain and France would have resisted at Munich and refused to do this that there were German generals ready to remove Hitler. But what happened? They caved, they appeased, and Hitler grew stronger. The bully became stronger again. Now, once he moves his troops into the Sudetenland, that border of the Alps, that defensive barrier known as the Alps is gone. So the Czechs, if they choose to fight, well, chances are it's not going to go well. So they choose not to. So Hitler will move his armies into Czechoslovakia in March of 1939. So how long did it take? Six months. Okay, he moved his armies into the state land and then just marched in the Czech. They did not fight. So to this point, 
Hitler has taken over two countries and has not had to fire a shot. Okay. Now, he's been exposed as a failure. Now, there's this guy named Winston Churchill. Now, you know he's going to become the prime minister, but he's not at this point. Churchill is a backbencher in the British Parliament. So if you've ever seen the British Parliament, unlike ours where we have kind of stadium seating in our House and Senate, kind of stadium seating, Parliament is on two sides of the room. Okay? Churchill began his political career as a liberal, and he was a backbencher. Have I talked about this? He was in the Liberal Party, and nobody liked him in the party, so that's why you're a backbencher. You're not in leadership. The leadership sits at the front. You understand? Then he switched to the Tories or to the Conservative Party, and they didn't like him either. He was a backbencher with the Tories. But there was always that voice coming from the back of the parliament, whichever side he was on at the time. Winston Churchill from the back bench yelling about Adolf Hitler and warning people about Adolf Hitler. See, Churchill had read his book. And if you want to know Hitler's plan, read his book. You guys have all heard of ISIS, Islamic State. You want to know what their plans are? Read the book. The book is the Quran. And they're trying to fulfill the prophecy of the Quran. That's their plan. Pretty simple. Hitler has a plan, okay, which we're going to see develop over time here. Okay, so here's Chamberlain, Hitler, and then Chamberlain. Now, I have a video. That same dude from the Council of Foreign Relations. Want to watch it? response. Okay, it does. All right, so here's another map of uh, the Sudetenland. Okay, here, this is Czech ter territory ceded to Germany in Munich September 38. Okay, Czech territory given to Hungary by Germany and Italy at Vienna in October of 38. And then this is Czech territory annexed by Poland in November of 38. Now, I'm not sure why the Poles did this, probably for defensive purposes, to put troops in there for fear that the Germans would use this corridor to invade Poland. Okay. Um, this probably had something to do with Mussolini. Okay, so Italy got some of this territory as well as, uh, actually, Hungary gets this. Italy was part of that decision. Okay. So. Czechoslovakia is carved up. You guys all know Dr. Seuss. This is Dr. Seuss. And on this platform, the most amazing, amazing uh, marvel of the age. He lives, he talks, yet he has no guts. He is the appeasement.
modern day appeasement. You got terrorism here. Okay. Bones. Give a dog a bone. Okay. Is appeasement. Good boy, see. I give I give nice doggy a bone and he goes away. Right? No, he's not going away. <coughs> Dr. Seuss again, you got this creepy octopus monster thing, Nazi octopus thing, and you know, play him a nice song, be nice to him, play nice, and he won't eat you. It's a little bit of a dig on CNN, sorry, but it is a political cartoon. Modern 20th, 21st century journalism in the 20th century. Okay, New York Times, U.S. overreacts, Duke's Japan, President ignores pleas for proportional response to Pearl Harbor War. Okay, now, we're in a Catholic school, obviously there's something called just war, okay, proportionality, and so forth, yes? Okay, now, for most Americans, when we dropped the bombs in 1945, most Americans were happy that the war was over, okay? This one here, kind of funny. Uh, by invading here at Normandy, the Allies are collectively punishing the French for the Nazi occupation of their country. Maybe CNN's take, take in 1945, or 1944. All right, so what else is going on? Well, Italy's turn. So Germany has taken Austria and Czechoslovakia. So in April, Italy is going to invade Albania. Now, can you picture in your map where Albania is? In proportionality to Italy. What see? Not the Caspian. A GNC. Okay, so here's the boot of Italy. The heel. Here's Albania. Adriatic Sea. Adriatic Sea, right here. GN's over here. Did I say G? Yeah. I'm sorry. Adriatic. One of the vacations my wife and I are looking at this summer is up here in Croatia. To the Medjugorje. Where's that? Uh, I think it's like the one right in the right by Croatia. Oh, I don't know. It's close. No, I mean, it's it's on the map. But. Okay. Okay, so Italy invades on April 7th. Okay, remember March uh, when uh, Czechoslovakia was taken by the Germans. Now, President Roosevelt is going to send a letter to Adolf Hitler. He's going to give him a list of countries, 31 long. Asking Hitler not to invade these countries for 10 years. Adolf Hitler is going to read this letter in front of the German Reichstag, where he is going to mock the President of the United States. We want no Swedes. We want no Poles. We want no Dutch. He goes through the list, mocking the President of the United States. Okay? Basically, 
basically, this is a, a letter saying, listen, we're not ready for war. We're not going to be ready for war. So if you could wait until we're ready for war, we'd appreciate that. Which might be construed as a form of what? So Roosevelt's obviously not happy about being ridiculed by Hitler. So he goes to Congress and says, hey, can we now start sending weapons and munitions to our friends? And what does Congress say? No. We're going to remain neutral. For now. Okay. Getting closer and closer, guys, to World War II. That's a picture of the Reichstag. I guess they have a little bit of a dome. Yeah, that's when it was on fire. <laughs> it was the communists! All right. Checking in with our friends in Japan again. See how things are going. Now, Japan, obviously, guys, has continued to incur further and further into China. And so Congress ends its commercial treaty with Japan. Now, we're not cutting them off yet. Yeah, am I on a cleanup? Oh, no. Let's see if uh, I'm in here. How many boxes are you in Yeah. Who? Yeah, we're long. Sorry. I'm trying to get that thing care of. There's some of those uh, wipes over here. Sanitary, though. Do not use it. Do not, that's going to burn your nose. Just don't breathe it. Use it. It'll be don't really use it, right? I mean, you already got a mouth. Don't. No. Your nose is going to burn. Oh, I thought it was going to burn. Oh. Is somebody going to clean that out? Like, I mean, it's like, who's in charge of the recycling? Yeah, where are they? Because there's, like, there's stuff in there that's been in there for weeks. I don't know how like snot. <laughs> it's like an incubator over here. Oh, oh, I thought that was just a trash can. <laughs> At least it's sanitary now. <laughs> He's cleaned it. one white vest was clean. <laughs> there was three in there. Okay. So. Guys, we're not cutting off the Japanese yet, but this allows us to cut off the Japanese when we're ready. Okay? We're still going to trade with them. Um, now, these war materials could be a lot of different things. It could be weapons. It could be oil. And that's the big one. We are a huge exporter of oil to Japan during this time period and today, for that matter. Okay? Yes, sir. Why is Croatia shaped like that? Um, they carved it up after Yugoslavia. Okay, so when the Cold War <laughs> ended, um, and so like Czechoslovakia broke up into Slovakia and Czech Republic, and Yugoslavia was broken up into several different countries, uh, mostly based on ethnic and religious people 
They tried to where people live. Okay, that didn't solve all the problems because if you go to um, Bos uh, Serbia here, okay, um, you have that little one called Kosovo. There was a war there in the 90s between the Mus the Christians and the Muslims there in Kosovo. You had a majority Christian population and a minority Muslim population, and the Christians started ethnically cleansing the Muslims. This was in the 1990s, and uh, we got involved uh, and tried to stop that. And, and indeed, we did, in the end, stop it, uh, but uh, those relations are very still tense to this day. There's a good movie called Behind Enemy Lines uh, with Owen Wilson about that war. Let's go. You know Owen Wilson? He's the blonde guy with the bad nose. He goes, what? No. Zoolander. I was thinking like a serious movie. Or... He's a pilot in this movie. It's, it's really good. It's, it's a fantastic movie. I've always ever seen him not in a comedy. Loosely, loosely based on a true story of an American pilot. Okay, you guys get that? Okay. Don't worry about that, it's on this next one. Okay, the world is shocked by what happens next. Hitler stuns the world by signing a non-aggression pact with Russia, the Soviet Union. Now, from the very beginning, when the Nazis started running for office, they had talked about a couple different things. First, their hatred of communism and the communists, and Lebensraum, or living space, living room for the German people that would be found in the East in Russia. So the playbook is this. They're going to invade Russia at some point. But then he signs a non-aggression pact with that. Now I kind of spoiled, gave you a spoiler the other day when I told you every nation that Hitler invaded, he signed a non-aggression pact with first. Okay, so what is Stalin thinking here? Well, Stalin is buying time. He's trying to buy time. He's also kind of in denial. Uh, I took a class in graduate school called The Rise and Fall of the Soviet Empire. And Stalin at this point knows Hitler has intentions for Russia, but he doesn't want to hear about it. As we get closer and closer to that actual invasion, Stalin will actually end up killing generals that are pestering him about this issue. Now, he had told the German people that the communists, the Russians, were their prime enemy. Now, there's the part of the pact that is public that the world is made aware of, and then there's the part of the pact that is secret that the world is not made aware of. So, the secret, the, the, what the world knows is that this is just a non-aggression pact. The secret part is that there's this poor country that lies between Russia and Germany, Poland, which is going to be divided up between the two powers. They were just like talking about, oh yeah, you can have this side of this country. Yes. yes. Now for Russia, this creates somewhat of a buffer. So when the Germans do invade and they want to invade Russia, they're going to have to conquer eastern Poland first and then get into Russia. Let me draw another crude map. So 
What's the capital? Warsaw. Okay. Another name for this pact is called the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact. This is a picture of the signing of the agreement. Hitler is not present. I don't think you're going to see Hitler and Stalin in a room together. But Uncle Joe is present. Okay. This is the top German general. Okay. Ribbentrop. Okay. So Joachim von Ribbentrop, Joseph Stalin stand behind Soviet Commissioner Molotov. Okay. As he signs this document. You guys have heard of a Molotov cocktail. You know what that is? Ready? You know what a Molotov cocktail is? You know what a Molotov cocktail is? Yeah. You've seen one, you just didn't know what it was called. So you take a wine bottle, okay? And you fill it with gasoline. You put a rag in it. You light the rag on fire. And then you throw it. The Molotov cocktail. Do a little firebomb. Now, here's the deal. Germany's going to get Western Poland. Soviet Union's going to get Eastern Poland. And Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, up on the Baltic. So these three small countries up on the Baltic Sea. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. Russia's going to get them. And that, you know, that just kind of goes back, guys. When we talk about the Russians, they go into Europe, and then they recede out of Europe. They go into Europe, they recede out. Today, guys, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania are all part of what military alliance? NATO. And when they got to join NATO, it was a relief for these people. Because the Russians have been meddling in their affairs for centuries. Okay, now they're part of our military alliance. Okay, real quick, yeah. So, much greater with like, well, how big was the USSR population at the time? <coughs> and how much bigger was it than Germany's? I don't know. We can look it up. Population of Russia and Germany in 1940. Okay. Now, real quick, uh, your mom and dads and I were alive. I think they were. Um, when the Soviet Union collapsed, communism collapsed in Europe. And Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania became independent again. I was playing college baseball in Georgia. Not Georgia, which used to be part of Russia, but Georgia and the United States. Because Georgia broke away, too, from Russia. But I was living in Georgia, U.S., in the South, playing college baseball. And this team, baseball team from Lithuania, came and did a tour of the East Coast of the United States after they became free, independent again. So we played this team from Lithuania. They were not very good at baseball yet. I think we won. But in kind of uh, Russian tradition fashion, they brought gifts. You guys know the little Russian dolls? You stack the dolls, okay? They brought us those dolls, and then we gave them, you know, hats and different stuff as we exchanged gifts and goodwill. It was kind of a, it was a neat, neat time, okay. 
Okay. Now, um, this gives them a buffer against each other. Now, the world is really surprised by this. Now, I'm going to stop for a minute and tell you a story, okay? When I was in graduate school, uh, taking modern European history, um, our professor had us read this book. It's called Neighbors by Jan Gross, okay? And this is a awful story, which happened when this invasion took place. So, guys, shortly after they split up Poland, it's going to look like this. So, on September 1st, 1939, in September 17th, 1939, Poland will be invaded by these two powers, okay? 90% of the Polish army is on the Western Front. Only 10% of the Polish army is on the flank on the Eastern Front. So when the Germans invade, the Poles are going to put up some resistance. There are rivers and so things, so forth that the Germans are going to have to cross. But Warsaw, the capital, will fall in the German sector. When the Russians invade two weeks later, there's no resistance, hardly at all. So the Russians are going to move much faster than the Germans will. In this book, Neighbors is about a town just northwest of Poland, uh, of Warsaw, called Genwabe. It's a small town of about 3,000 people. What's interesting about this town is that about half the population, 1,500, are Jewish. And the other half of the population is Polish or probably Catholic. Because the vast majority of Poles are Catholic. Okay? There are over 3 million Jews living in Poland. Remember, I told you there's only about 250,000 Jews living in Germany. So when the Germans invade on the first, if you're Jewish and you're living in Poland, do you think that you've probably heard already of some of the treatment of Jews in Germany? Yes. There was, and I haven't gone over this, but I will. There's this thing called Crystal Knot, where the night of broken glass, some of you guys probably have heard of, in 1938, which was well publicized, where they burned Jewish synagogues and businesses to the ground all over Germany. And some of that actually bled into Poland. So, if you're Jewish and you're living in this small town of Genwabe, and you hear the Germans have invaded, what is going through your mind? You're frightened. Yeah, so you can flee, hope that the Polish army stands up and defeats them. Here's what happens then. Because there's very little resistance on the Eastern Front, the Soviets are going to go too far. And so the first troops to show up in this small town with the invasion of Poland are Soviet troops. They show up in this small town. The Jews? Have to because it's not the Nazis. Do you understand? They're happy 
They're like, oh my gosh, thank goodness it's the Russians, not the Germans. And so they say, hey, to the Soviet troops, hey, welcome to our town. What can we do to accommodate you while you're here? Do you need anything? They're like, go stand up to the Soviet army. And the Poles in this town are like, what's up with these Jews? Why are they being so nice to this invading army? What's wrong with that? Why are these Jews behaving like this? Now, these people have lived together. They've worked together. They've gone to school together in community, small town. And then the Russians realize they've gone too far. And so they leave. And a few days later, guess who shows up? The Germans. Now, here's the thing about the Holocaust, guys. The German infantry, the Wehrmacht, they don't deal with the Jewish problem. The German infantry's job is to kill enemy troops, to win wars, to win battles. They don't deal with the Jews. There's a group that comes in after the infantry called the Eitzengruppen, and they're the ones that deal with the Jews. So when the Germans show up in this town a few days later, obviously the Jews are scared. And the Poles saw the reaction of the Jews towards the Soviets, and they start cozying up to the Germans. And they're like, Welcome to our town. Is there anything we can do for you? Uh, by the way, we know you don't like Jews. Uh, do you want us to help you? Listen, if your country is invaded, it doesn't matter what you are, you're scared. And the Polish people in this town were scared. So they were doing, they were in survival mode. And whatever they could do to help the Germans, they were going to try and do because they wanted to live. Do you understand? Now, nobody knew about this story until the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991. When the Soviet Union collapsed, guys, they opened up their archives where researchers could go in and see what happened. Because, guys, after this war, you guys know, you know anything about World War II, you know the Germans are going to invade Russia, and then eventually the Russians are going to push the Germans back. And for 40 years, the Soviet Union will control Poland after the war. Poland will be communist. So nothing came out of Poland for 40 years after the war. But when it collapsed, they opened the archives, and researchers like J.N.T. Gross went into the Soviet archives and stumbled across a court case where the Soviets had put some of these Poles on trial for mass murder. Because what happened when the Nazis showed up, the Polish people in this town told the German troops, they said, listen, what can we help you with? And some of the Poles started acting badly. They took advantage of the situation. They attacked some of their neighbors, the Jews. They started looting their homes and robbing their homes. Some of the Jews were fleeing. They were just taken off. And the townspeople, the mayor, and others cozied up to the Germans and said, you want us to help you with it? And the German infantry said, no, this is not our problem. We don't deal with this. Just go away. But it was too late. Some of the townspeople had already committed a couple murders of the Jewish people and looted their homes. Of the 1,500 Jews that lived in this town, about 300 of them escaped to tell this story. Because eventually what the townspeople did is they rounded up all the Jews and brought them to the town center. For the German army. And the German army's like, listen, we're not doing this. They were already guilty. And so they put them in a barn, 1,200 Jews, 
put them in a big barn, not far from the town center, lock the doors. And even before the Eitzen group could show up to deal with the Jewish problem, they torched it. Killing 1,200 innocent Jews. Not the Germans, but their Polish neighbors. It's a horrible story. Now, you can criticize the Soviets for a lot of things, okay? But when they heard about this, after they took Poland, they put the town leaders on trial for this mass murder. And they kept, they kept the court transcripts from this trial of mass murder. And it's all written about in this book called Neighbors. Okay, yeah. Over the translation. Yes. Okay. It's a horrible story. But it shows you what can happen and things that only happen when there's a war going on. If there's no war, people don't act like this, guys. People don't turn on their neighbors like this. Now, we've seen instances of this in the United States. If you go back to the Tulsa riots in the 1920s, where white people went into Tulsa, into this town, suburb of Tulsa, which was populated by blacks, and torched it and killed a bunch of people, over 300 people. Okay. But normally this stuff doesn't happen. It's a sad story. I just want to share that with you. Okay. Originally it was supposed to look like this. Okay, where this would not be occupied, but it ended up looking more like this. So this will be the Soviet side. This will be the German side. Okay. And I have that in subsequent slides coming up. Okay. But that's the time to tell the story. Um, population of both the USSR had about 170 million, and Germany had like 70. Yeah, Stalin had an almost unlimited population of Pol Pot. Okay. So, here we go. As Hitler begins to threaten Poland, Britain finally steps up to the plate. France steps up to the plate, and they say this. If Poland... Romania or, or Bulgaria are invaded, that they would come to, the, they would get in the war. Now, did Britain and France send troops to Poland ahead of time? Poles are on their own. So it's September 1st, 1939, which most historians use as the start of World War One. Excuse me, World War II. I like September 3rd because that is when Britain and France declare war. Uh, and it's easy to remember. 9339. As I mentioned, on September 17th, Soviets will invade on the Eastern Front. Within two weeks of that, Poland will be divided. So in all, the battle for Poland lasts just over one month. One month. The tactics, war, now change. Technology has improved immensely since World War I. And the Germans have 
set up a strategy many of you guys are familiar with known as lightning warfare or what? Blitzkrieg. Which I will describe in detail for you tomorrow. Okay. After much debate, the U.S. Congress repeals the arms, arms embargo. We will now send not only weapons, but we will send munitions as well to our friends. And I will describe for you tomorrow how the Germans were able to take Poland so quickly with this lightning warfare. Good? Not good. 